Hello, my name is Allison Galloway. I am the campus provost and the executive vice chancellor for UC Santa Cruz. And I would like to welcome everybody today to this 12th annual MITRE lecture. Uh, this is a really big event for us. It's actually the beginning of the Founders uh, series of events, which is a celebration that goes for about a month that really honors the things that really make Santa Cruz great. I mean, you see Santa Cruz great. And a lot of those things, well, Santa Cruz is great too. <laughs> um, but what we're really interested in honoring with this series of lectures is the real interdisciplinary nature of the work that is done here. And I think that is something that really exemplifies um, the MITRE lectures. For 12 years now, we have had a whole series of people come. Everything from notable writers, from academics, to artists, to Nobel laureates, many different people. We've had talks, anything from uh, the Dharma of capitalism to analyses of Sajidit Rai's films. All of these kinds of things come together in a rich intellectual life here at Santa Cruz, and this is encapsulated in the Mitra lectures. All of them have been intellectually very enriching and engaging, and all of them have been also sponsored by the UC uh, Santa Cruz Foundation. So we have to thank them as well. But the real thanks that we owe is to Anna Luther uh, Mitra, and she has been a great friend to UC Santa Cruz. We all know her as, as Anna, and she has, um, She's one of those friends upon which you want to be able to rely and you know that you can always turn to her. She's the kind of person who is a, a stalwart supporter of Santa Cruz, but not one who does that mindlessly. She really understands the core of our campus, the core mission of our campus, and takes that to heart. And so we really owe a great debt to her, regardless of the fact that she is also the sponsor for the uh, Mitra Lectures. She was also a former foundation president, and the foundation is very instrumental in bringing together many different aspects of the support network for the campus. At this point, I would like to have Anna come onto stage um, and tell you more about the speaker for tonight, uh, Sandri Faber. Sandri, I, why am I skipping over Sandra Faber? Faber. <laughs> okay. One of those times when you just say, my tongue is tripping over itself. Um, I have known Sandy for many years, and um, I am actually very delighted at this point to get to know more of her research. Most of what I've heard about has been her work uh, with the administration and her, um, and her role as the director of the Lick Observatories. And so I'm really in excited about this possibility. But first, I would like to bring Anu onto stage to introduce Sandy and let you know what we will be talking about. Anna? Uh, thank you, Alison, for being here. I may be the woman in the middle, but this is a real privilege. That spot resides between the top ranking woman at the university and the first woman speaker of this series, our very own, very distinguished Sandy Faber. This is an official UCSC lecture, and I'm grateful for the sustained support of Vice Chancellor Donna Murphy and Director Anne McCrow of University Relations, who have helped nurture and sculpt this event. Many of you know that this is also an intensely personal series, named in memory of my husband. It is endowed by Siddharth's friends, Kiran and Arjun Malhotra, and is very special this year in that it is attended for the first time by Sid's parents-in-law, children and grandchildren, four generations are here, and Sid's wife is... <laughs> and Sid's wife is very happy to see her mama and papa, Sonali and Julio, Aditya, Ryan and Rafa in the audience. And if a god could grant me the wish that Sid be here for one lecture of the series, this would be it. 
Astronomy was his passion, and the thoroughly modern Mitra was a scientist who understood that we were in the midst of the ultimate Copernican revolution. Our Earth is not at the center of our solar system. The Sun is not at the center of the Milky Way, and our galaxy is not at the center of the universe. This knowledge also informed his worldview. He was a rationalist, an atheist, and a secular humanist. It is hard, I think, to spend good chunks of your time looking at the night sky and reflecting on our place in it without becoming that way. Thank you all for coming to this debate, coming to this lecture and choosing it over the debate that's happening <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> But Sandy does have a lovely story to tell about the exquisite beauty of the cosmic web, the drama of giant stars exploding under their own weight, the ghosts of dark energy and dark matter, the search for a culprit named Big Bang hiding behind an, iron, an opaque curtain. She might even take us to that magic moment of creation that inspires more awe and reverence than anything we have dreamed of or made up. And while epic in its dimension, the story is also wondrously finite. I think it is already amazing that we now attach numbers that not long ago were referred to as infinity. We can say with a straight face, there are one, maybe 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. We can argue about whether the universe is 13.71 or 13.72 billion years old. Sandy also has a very provocative title to her talk, The Modern Genesis. It contains an implicit challenge to the classical version, and her trump card is that it rests on the thinking of the best minds our planet has ever produced. Elegant theory, capable of being disproved in its formulation, but not. Its predictions are validated by observation. How can you resist her menage a trois of observational astronomy, general relativity, and quantum mechanics? But when I hear those words, I feel a strange stirring, a combination of fascination and panic. How can I possibly get this? But that is the charm of Sandy. She is the perfect preacher, speaks in a tongue we can follow, and she inspires trust. She is someone in whom matter and energy are concentrated in a way that makes for an incredible density of honors and high voltage list of accomplishments. Sandy is university professor at UCSC and interim director of the UC observatories. Between 2006-11, she served as the chair of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. She received her undergraduate degree from Swarthmore and a PhD from Harvard. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. This combination is an extremely rare distinction. She has received five honorary doctorates and her stash of gold includes the Heinemann Prize, the Bauer Prize, the Russell Prize, the Bruce Medal, Harvard Centennial Medal. These are for specific, specific works, as well as for lifetime contributions to the science. She is an academic superstar. But I'll let you decide for yourself if she's deserving. She has co-authored 250 scientific articles. She is the intrepid explorer who set about obtaining the best tools of her trade. She established the scientific case for the need for giant telescopes and used the Keck II, the most powerful instrument of its kind in the world, to collect spectra of 50,000 distant galaxies and study galaxy formation 10 billion years ago. Today she leads Candles, the largest project in the history of the Hubble telescope to extend our view back to the time of the Big Bang. Her major discoveries include 
the first structural scaling law for galaxies, large-scale flow perturbations in the expansion of the universe caused by superclusters of galaxies, and the ubiquitous black holes at the centers of galaxies. As a woman myself, I'm proud to say that Captain Sandy has boldly gone where no man has gone before. <laughs> joyously bouncing from one singularity to another. She is the consummate logician. She and her colleagues formulated what is now the standard paradigm for galaxy and cluster formation based on cold dark matter. She was one of the three astronomers who diagnosed the optical flaw in the Hubble and then helped in its repair. So here we are on spaceship UCSC and Sandy is our three-in-one Kirk, Spock, and Scotty. <laughs> but before you come on board, I must alert you to a problem with what my favorite poet, Vikram Sait, calls the will to know. In the dozen years since Sid has been gone, things have gotten much worse. Not only are we not at the center of anything, we live in a universe that is mostly about ravenous black holes and mysterious dark energy. And this ultimate knowledge translates into what astrophysicist Lawrence Krauss, who I wish were my friend, calls a complete irrelevance. As matter, we really don't matter. <laughs> so is there no meaning to life? These are questions I especially ask when I experience a significant life event, more like a shattering non-life event. I now have a two-part answer that I'd like to share. First, not having a larger meaning to life is not entirely a bad thing. It is the ultimate justification for having a good time in a life that we are fortunate to have. And what good fortune it is. We exist at a special time and space wherein, as sentient beings, we can actually observe the audacious, amazing exquisiteness of our irrelevance. <laughs> we can look back at moments just after the Big Bang, and knowing that the universe is expanding and moving away uh, is expanding, we can anticipate a future when all other galaxies have moved away from us and have left us to the solitude of our own galaxy. Eventually, observable manifestations of the Big Bang will cease to exist. We may already be irrelevant, but in the future, we will also be alone and unable to observe what we can today. This is a real pity. And if we are inclined to worry about those less fortunate than us, we ought to make sure that we leave behind a legacy of records, including lectures such as this, featuring speakers such as Sandy. So in other words, have a good time, but do a little bit of good as well. I guess Sid did not make it to our party, but it is time to bring on Sandy, and I hope as compensation, she will let me peek at the glorious luminescence of an event horizon around an insatiable black hole, one that gobbles matter, where loved ones sink into oblivion, but where they play one final role. They give up whatever energy they can. And that energy radiates back into our universe to light it up and perhaps give birth to new stars and new worlds. I dedicate this lecture to all our dear ones who have fallen thus, including my own brother who passed away this year. With that, I invite you to get your telescopes out and extend your horizons along with Sandy. Sandy Faber.
Gee, it's wonderful to be here and to be honored with a spot in this distinguished slate of wonderful lecturers who have just entertained us over the years. And thank you so much for that lovely, if somewhat lengthy, introduction there, Anna. I thought for a moment we were going to step into cosmic time. The universe, the visible universe, expanded by a whole ten light minutes while you were talking. <laughs> and I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight because as United Airlines likes to say, we know you had a choice. <laughs> but I want to console you with the thought that you're not missing so much because, <laughs> not for the reason you think. <laughs> Uh, I, I expect they're talking a lot about federal spending, government spending, and fiscal policy. And there's more overlap there with cosmology than you might think. So, <laughs> I'm sure this is what Obama has said, and this is probably <laughs> what Romney is saying in return. And I'm going to talk about these two things also, and I'm going to do these guys one better because I'm going to show that they're the same thing. <laughs> and they are not going to manage to do that tonight. <laughs> so this talk might wind up being a little long because I'm going to try to do two things at once. One thing is the first part, which is uh, to describe the relatively well-known parts of cosmology. And then in the second part, I'm going to take off and talk about some more speculative things. But before we plunge in, I think it would be good to get our bearings. And I'm going to start with this video. It has a credit here, Brent Tully, Institute of Astronomy, but actually our professor, Joel Premack, played a huge role in making this video. It's about 10 years old now, but it's still one of the most effective tours of the universe that I have seen. So we're starting out on Earth in our galaxy and we're flying towards Orion. You'll recognize the constellation there. And for quite a bit of this, um, all the stars are in the right place. As we get farther away, it gets a little sketchier. And what you notice is that Orion is dissolving. Orion is not really in one place in space. It's a convenient lineup of stars. But there are some interesting things there. We're flying into the Orion Nebula. We'll hear more about that in a little while. And then behind Orion is uh, the nebula is the Horsehead Nebula, famous. And then the next thing we're going to see is the Rosette Nebula. These are all regions of glowing gas that have been lit up by a generation of young stars just forming. And as we fly through the Rosette here, you can see those bright stars at the center. They're only a few million years old. And now the camera is going to pan over to another glowing object, which is quite different. This is a dying star. This is the Crab Nebula which exploded about a thousand years ago. It has a little pulsar at the middle, if you look closely. And now I think the best part of this video kicks in because it rather brilliantly segues into another neighboring galaxy that we know and love, NGC 5383, which the makers of this video thought pretty well matched the properties of our Milky Way. So that's NGC 5383. And you can see the large and small Magellanic clouds coming into view, some other small galaxies. And pretty soon, the field of view pans off into the distance, and we see uh, another pair of galaxies. These are the small triangulum galaxy here, M33. We're going to fly through it. And then there's Andromeda, our famous big neighbor in space there in the background. So this is the local group. These galaxies with roughly 50 or 60 smaller things are our companions in space. And now the camera pans out into larger di distances, more distant realms, and we fly through and past a lot of very well-known galaxies that are familiar to amateurs with their telescopes. There's M101. The Whirlpool Nebula, where spiral structure was discovered, is coming next. 
And the glory of this video is that Brent Tully spent his lifetime mapping all of these nearby galaxies. So to a good approximation, all these galaxies are images of real objects, first of all, and they're in the right place, and they're the right size. He had to brighten them. He, uh, they don't look very bright to the naked eye, but aside from that, this is a faithful map of the universe, and you can see that the galaxies are irregularly distributed in filaments, and the filaments intersect in clusters, and now we're landing in the center of the Virgo cluster, about a thousand galaxies, where there's a giant elliptical at the center, and we're flying to the center and it stops, which is a good thing because that's the most massive black hole that's known at the center of a galaxy, about um, three billion solar masses. So it's good that we stop there. <laughs> so um, this, I think, you know, gives you a very good picture of the cosmic landscape. And what you'll notice today is that the universe is not smooth. It's very clumpy. It's clumpy in galaxies, and the galaxies are clustered into clusters of galaxies, which we call large-scale structure. So the first question that I'd like to discuss with you is why the universe is clumpy. And the answer turns out to be remarkably simple. The clumps are made by gravity. So let's go back to the early universe when it was smooth, almost smooth, and there are small density fluctuations. We'll talk more about them in a little while. And picture now yourself at the peak of a density fluctuation. The universe is expanding around you, and because there's a little extra density there, the expansion is retarded, and matter tends to get pulled onto that peak. And that makes the peak grow. It increases its contrast, and it's a runaway phenomenon. It's something called an instability. So it turns out that if you put matter in the universe, okay, this is the matter, two kinds, dark matter, we'll say more about that in a little while, and normal matter. Normal matter is what we're made of here in this room. Put that in an expanding universe, with some density irregularities and model this in a computer and this is what you get. So we're going to start with an absolutely typical piece of the universe that's not quite smooth. It's going to expand and as I promised the lumps get bigger, they grow, and by the same token the underdense regions lose their matter to the peaks. So that old adage, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You see, I told you there was a parallel between cosmology and economics. <laughs> Is at work here. So I encourage you to uh, watch a little piece of this, like maybe look at those two little objects right there. Can you see my cursor? Yes, you can. Okay, so just follow this and what you'll see is that the lumps merge into other lumps. And we call this a process of hierarchical clustering. And it works this way because of the way that the fluctuations were put in at the beginning. And I haven't told you anything about that process, but I will before the end of this lecture. Okay? So it, it turns out that this process is kind of scale-free in the sense that we could be looking at the formation of a galaxy here, or we could be looking at the formation of a cluster of galaxies. Either one would match. However, what's modeled here is the so-called dark matter, which is about five-sixths of all the matter. And because it's most of the matter, its gravity is doing all the work. The dark matter gravity is sort of the scaffolding on which all the rest of the structure is built. But Dark matter is amazing stuff. We actually don't know yet what it is. It's probably some kind of new, as yet undiscovered, elementary particle. And it's quite massive, maybe a hundred times more massive than a proton, but it behaves like a neutrino. By that I mean it just goes through things. It doesn't interact, it doesn't stop. A neutrino can go through six light years of lead before getting stopped, and dark matter is like that. And because, well, let me just say a little bit more about the dark matter, actually. Dark matter is everywhere. It's right here in this room. There are particles of dark matter that are in orbit about the center of our Milky Way galaxy. These 
particles are orbiting at a speed of uh, two or three hundred kilometers a second, something like that. And um, how big is it? Well, um, or how much is there of it? Supposing we had a quart container here, there'd be about 10 dark matter particles in that quart. Okay? By the same token, supposing I had a mass of dark matter particles equal to a quarter, quart of milk. And if I took that quart of milk and spread it at uniform density throughout the Earth, that's another way of thinking about the density of dark matter. So, not very dense, much less dense than the material of this room, but there's so much of it over such large volumes that its gravity dominates the gravity of the galaxy. However, dark matter, because it doesn't interact, it's not charged, it doesn't give off photons, it doesn't absorb photons, it's invisible. And so we need to make a different kind of model if we want to understand what our telescopes actually see when we look at galaxies. So this is another video made by some Japanese and um, beautifully rendered. And this is the opposite side of the coin. The dark matter is here and its gravity is causing the clustering, but we don't see it. Instead, we're just seeing the gas and the stars that are forming. So the gas is the, um, the, the um, smooth bluish tint here in this picture. And in dense regions, stars form and they're white. So what you see here is a region of space that is making our Milky Way galaxy. And it was very chaotic at the beginning because of this hierarchical clustering. Small bits form and then merge to make larger bits. And every time one of these little proto-galaxies collides with another, you can see that the stars that have already formed get scattered all over the place. And gas continues to fall in from the expanding universe and reform a disk. And so sooner or later, as the gas is used up and the clustering stops, we're left with uh, a stellar structure and a disk of gas. So the stellar structure is rather spherical and it's called a spheroid. The gas that reforms makes a flattened structure and new stars to form there will make disk stars. Okay? So it's rather consoling to find out that galaxies actually look like this. They exhibit both disks and spheroids like the models. So here are some mostly disk galaxies. They tend to be flattened rotating structures and we see three of them here at different angles like a kind of a frisbee face on and edge on. And here are some galaxies that are mostly spheroids with little disk. And depending upon which one you get here depends on the, the collisional structure, the collisional history of the galaxy. Now, why would you want to believe what I'm telling you? Um, maybe the model is wrong. I think we need more evidence. So fortunately, the Hubble telescope comes to the rescue, which permits us, with its deep power of gazing out into space, to look back in time. So the famous Hubble Ultra Deep Field is shown here to scale against the moon. And it, this is a completely random patch of space. This is uh, probably the most expensive picture in the history of humankind. I think, I think that I figured this one out, this is about $20 million, this one single picture. It took um, Hubble a couple of weeks of exposure time. So there are 10,000 galaxies here. Let's blow them up. Uh, and you can see that they exhibit a wealth of different um, morphologies and sizes. And miracle of miracles, we can actually estimate how far away every one of those galaxies is. And once we've done that, we can arrange this picture out in space, like kind of a core drilling, both out in space and back in time. And then we can make a movie. And that's what's shown here. Here's the picture with all the galaxies strung out in their proper distances along the line of sight. So just remember that distance is look back time. So as we start out here, we're looking at nearby galaxies that are the same age as we are, 13, 14 billion years. And they look pretty big and pretty regular. 
They look like the ellipticals and the spirals that I was just telling you about. But what's interesting now is as we fly further back, the galaxies are getting sparser and they're getting smaller and they're getting more irregular. And that's exactly what we predict from this hierarchical clustering model. We're looking at infant galaxies that have just barely formed. And in fact, we get to a point in the Hubble data where we see the last galaxy. We could see more, but we've run out of galaxies. And we're hitting a time period. Remember, distance is time. So now we're very far back in time within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. And um, we've reached a place that astronomers affectionately call the Dark Ages. Now, we've solved one of our problems then. Um, because, you know, without these density fluctuations, the universe just would have expanded and nothing interesting would have happened. It would have become a, a thin soup, um, not very nourishing. So, these density fluctuations and the gravity that they caused created structure. They made galaxies where interesting things could happen. And the next thing that's going to happen in our galaxies is they're going to make stars. So here's our neighbor. We flew through it. We flew through that very actual region there, shown there. A beautiful picture of it here with Hubble. You can see all the bright young stars. They're lighting up the neighborhood. Stars are forming in the densest clouds of gas within the galaxies. And we see regions like this all over, both in our own galaxy and in other galaxies. And one of the most interesting regions, we've seen it before, it was in the Tully video. This is the nebula in the Sword of Orion. So thanks to Hubble, we can look at this in much more detail, blow it up, the heart of the Orion Nebula. And at this level of magnification, you can just begin to see some interesting things happening here. You know, some structures that aren't exactly point-like. Let's blow it up a little bit more. And this is a great region for two reasons. First of all, things that are glowing, we can see them. But we can also see things in silhouette because of the glowing gas behind. So in a region like this, we can even see structures that aren't shining by their own light if they absorb. So a map of those, a census of those structures has been taken in Orion and these are protostars that are beginning to form. The ones that are still glowing are the young ones and after a while their gas coagulates and they make a much more orderly rotating disks. So here is the young star that just formed and this is its solar nebula right around it. Same, home, same thing here, okay? We know that these are flattened rotating solar nebula, just like the planets in our solar system, because in a few cases we can see them edge on. We can actually see the star peeping up above and below this disk of gas. 17 times Pluto or Pluto's orbit is just about the size of the comet cloud, the so-called Oort cloud that feeds comets into our solar system. So you can see this dark stuff is, which is, uh, you know, collected there in the plane of this solar nebula is pretty important stuff. And it's, what is it? It's, it's composed of dust grains that are produced in the atmospheres of um, bloated, coal, cool stars that are in the process of dying. The atmospheres are so cool that metals and silicate grains can condense there and then they get blown out into outer space. And everywhere we look, in galaxies around us, we see these dark clouds. And these dark clouds, including our own galaxy, okay? So this is a neighboring galaxy. And the, here are the dark dust grains and here's our galaxy. Those dust grains are amazingly like cigarette smoke. You might think that the cosmos is full of a bunch of smoker addicts or something like that all over the place, filling up interstellar space with uh, smoke. And the size of these grains is uh, very, very similar to, to cigarette smoke. And putting a lot of them along the line of sight really adds up to a, a large amount of absorption. So they begin to really kick in and do something very important in these rotating proto-solar nebulae. This is a, sort of a, an artist 
fanciful conception, this isn't a real calculation, but we've got a, a protostar there, we've got this dusty rotating structure, and the dust particles are sticky. They stick to one another, they coagulate, and they coagulate into first meter size particles, and then larger size particles. These are the things that are making asteroids. And they're also making even larger objects that are the core of rocky planets. Jupiter has a core like this. This is what Earth is made out of. So when you go outside and you pick up a rock and heft it, what you're really looking at is material that was cooked in stars and thrown out into the interstellar medium and then coagulated in our solar nebula. So as you all know, because we're famous for this at Santa Cruz, uh, we discover planets here. And here's an example of uh, one of the earliest systems to be found here, Upsilon Andromeda, uh, was one of the very first multiple planets that was found. Now this is a totally fanciful artist conception. We have no idea if there's a planet there with rings like Saturn's rings. And you might actually even get the wrong impression about Upsilon Andromeda from this picture. It's sort of looking kind of normal. I mean, there's, a, you know, there's a planet there and another one here and out there there's Saturn. But don't think that because that innermost planet is actually a hot Jupiter planet which goes around Upsilon Andromeda in just a few days. So you can see that these solar systems that are being discovered are completely unlike our solar system. At least that's the case so far. And this shows that there are many, many ways to make a solar system. So I want you to file that away because we're going to need that fact. In the case of planets in a solar system, we have a cosmic machine out there that just generates all them in a wealth of different characteristics, shapes, masses, and so on. Okay, the cosmic machine. File that away, we'll talk about it in a little while. So I'm nearing the first end of the first part of my talk, which was to summarize everything that we know about our 14 billion years here. And uh, there's one thing now that I haven't told you, and that's where the heavy elements in these dust grains are coming from. The dust grains are made of carbon, silicon, magnesium, iron, um, and the early universe didn't have that, had only hydrogen and helium. So where did those heavy elements come from? They were cooked in massive stars in so-called supernovae explosions. So. Here's a 25 solar mass star that is um, one day away from exploding. Okay. It has cooked hydrogen to helium and in its inner layers the helium has combined to carbon. It's getting hotter in here. Then we can make, as the temperature goes up, we can make neon, oxygen, silicon, heavier, heavier, heavier. Finally we can make iron. And you might think, well, can't we make iron into something still heavier? And the answer is no, because to do that actually takes energy rather than give you energy. And so the star finds itself unable to support itself. No more, it starts to cool, there's no more nuclear energy that it can find, and so the core implodes, and in a sort of paradoxical situation not fully understood, this causes a supernova explosion, and all of these enriched outer layers go out into the interstellar medium, and that's where our elements come from. And, okay, that's where I came from, that's where you came from, that's where this room came from. So. At one point, at 4 a.m. when I couldn't sleep, I was compelled to try to estimate the number of supernovae that I had been in. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can't vouch for my ability to calculate at 4 a.m., um, but I came up with a million, okay? And the same, obviously, is true of you. So anytime anybody tells you that something is improbable and can't happen. Just come back with a retort, look, my atoms were all over the galaxy at one point, part of a d million different supernovae, and I'm here today, so, you know, take your argument and shove it. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've really finished um, the m chapter one. Chapter one being the basics of 
cosmology as we understand it, the history of a 14 billion year universe, how we got from the Big Bang to now. Oh, I'm anticipating. Sorry, I've left out a chapter. Uh, we had a supernova, we better have it explode. Okay? <laughs> so here is my low budget simulation of a supernova. This is, this is the Crab Nebula expanding. It went off a thousand years ago. And if you study what all of these filaments are made of, they're very much enriched in heavy elements. So we have a cosmic recycling picture. We have a galaxy here with a supernova in it, very bright for a brief time. The ejecta go out into the interstellar medium. The heavy elements mix with the gas. New stars are formed, which produce new supernovae. So every time we go around this cycle, the interstellar medium is enriched. And think about it, it means that the oldest stars couldn't make planets because they didn't have dust grains. It took many billions of years, actually, to get to the point where planets can form. And Another little interesting tidbit is the fact that the sun formed and its planets formed about as early as you possibly could. We were a bit lucky. Okay, so now let's embark on part two, which is uh, to talk about the things that are less well known. So I'm not claiming that everything here is completely understood. What is this? This is a schematic slice with a space dimension in that direction and time evolving this way. So the universe as it's evolving is starting from some smaller dense state and, and moving this way. And this is where we are now on this graph, our galaxy now. So this is generally known, or at any rate, as Donald Rumsfeld would like to say, there are known unknowns in this part. And what I want to talk about next are the unknown unknowns out here. What do I mean by that? I mean uh, events that are earlier in time than something here that's fairly well understood and well defined, or things that are beyond the visible universe on even larger scales. So, to understand this, we have to go back to the question of what's in the universe today. And we've already talked about the matter. But there's this other stuff here that's called dark energy. We need to understand the difference between those two things. So matter is matter. Whether it's dark matter or normal matter, it causes the universe to decelerate because it generates normal gravity, which is attractive. Whereas this dark energy, which is a huge mystery, completely not understood, causes the universe expansion to accelerate. It generates repulsive gravity. Now, how could you even have such a thing? The way you understand it is to compare and contrast how these two entities behave as the universe expands. Regular matter, as is intuitive to you, gets more dilute as the universe expands. If you have a gas and the room gets bigger, the density is going down. Whereas, hold on to your seats, dark energy is completely non-intuitive. It actually stays constant. It's an energy density, but it does not become more dilute as the universe expands. And if you put in these two different components into Einstein's equation of general relativity, you generate different signs of gravity. Matter is always attractive, and dark energy can be attractive or repulsive depending upon the sign that it has. And evidently the kind that we have is repulsive. So let's consider the consequences of, of this acceleration. Here's a little table that illustrates this. We are now going into a situation, we have dark energy now, it's causing the universe to accelerate. What does this mean? If dark energy actually stays constant, the size of the universe is doubling about every 11 billion years. That's the intensity of the dark energy that we have. So here we are at 14 billion years. Let's look at a galaxy that at the moment is moving away from us 
at 10,000 kilometers per second. This doubling causes the velocity to double of that same galaxy 11 billion years from then or from now. So in 25 billion years, the velocity of this object will be 20,000 kilometers a second. In 36 billion years, 40,000, okay? So it's doubling every 11 billion years. Now for a while that's fine, but in not too long we're going to get in trouble here. 69 billion years, we're going faster than the speed of light. So obviously this little simple example that I've given you has broken down. Things can't look like they're going faster than the speed of light. They actually can go faster than the speed of light, but they disappear in the process. Why is that? It's because they redshift. And so the galaxy will appear to disappear from us before it actually exceeds the speed of light as observed by us. Okay, this is a universe that is expanding faster than light. And I'd like to think about an analogy here. The analogy here is a universe with dark energy is like a black hole inside out. A black hole, you're familiar, attracts objects, falls in, these objects reach the speed of light at this Schwarzschild radius. With repulsive gravity, you can create an inside-out black hole and you can have objects accelerate to the speed of light away from you. And that's what's happening in this little example. So, this is a catastrophe for astronomy. All the galaxies that are now expanding away from us will redshift out of sight, except for the ones in the local group and the other little small members of our local group, because we're held together by real gravity. But everything else is going to disappear. So we're in sort of in the golden age of cosmology. Can you just imagine if there are sentient beings around 69 billion years from now, practically the rest of the universe, the cosmic microwave background, all the clues to the Big Bang, the origin of the universe will be invisible. And those beings will be stuck in galaxies and have to figure it all out just from, you know, looking at the Milky Way and Andromeda, which will not be easy. Now, another thing interesting happened in this example. Because of the inflation, we actually created matter energy. Dark energy is energy. And it has the potential to do things. Now we have more space with the same density. We've obviously created more of this. And so I want you to think of inflation as a very creative process that can actually generate new stuff and maybe we could do something with it depending upon the conditions. So let's fill in what we've just learned. We've just said that pretty recently our universe began to be dominated by dark energy, that's this line here, and this is the inflationary phase in which it's expanding and actually accelerating. And I've called this second inflation because actually before this was discovered, we had already figured out that there must be a first inflation, a first inflationary period, and then a relapse into normal expansion governed by attractive gravity. And now this new acceleration seems to be taking over. So I've emphasized that the thing that makes inflation is a non-zero constant energy density. And the curious thing is that this energy density is independent of having any particles. It's not matter, it's something new. It's called a vacuum energy density. The nice thing is that for first inflation, we actually have a theory of this. We have a theory that unifies the forces of nature, three of the four forces, called the Grand Unified Theory. And at an unbelievably high temperature, 10 to the 28th degrees Kelvin, and very early time in the history of the universe, we actually reached a condition in which the matter energy density of the universe was dominated by this vacuum energy density, and it had the property we need, namely, it didn't dilute, even though the universe was expanding. And so that caused a very rapid, but very brief spurt of acceleration. So let's look at this kind of schematic model. 
First of all, this is the radius of the observable universe, and this is where we are today. The radius of our universe today is about 10 to the 28 centimeters, and this is time, okay? And stuff is changing a lot, so we need to use this exponential notation. Look at this. This is 20 powers of 10 for every one of those tick marks. So we're going to go back in time to a very early time where these temperatures and conditions were reached. And there, there might have been normal in expansion before that, but we reached this uh, grand unified scalar field. We expanded hugely by many, many orders of magnitude. And then, miraculously, that field went away. And we had matter again and we have now normal expansion after that. That's sort of the standard theory of first inflation. That is what we need in order to make galaxies. The density fluctuations are caused during that first inflation period. How does that work? So I want you to imagine flying through the early universe at that time and you have a little meter which is measuring the energy density of that scalar field. And let's blow up a region here that has a peak and ask ourselves now what happens to this region if this whole thing here is expanding faster than the speed of light. At that point, see, this little fluctuation which came from quantum fluctuations which were coming and going, when you're in a universe that's expanding faster than the speed of light, they get sort of frozen in, they get seized by the throat, if you will. And before they can die away, they become large and they're, they're frozen in, they're macroscopic instead of microscopic. So it's a wonderful thing that happens when you have a universe expanding faster than the speed of light. First of all, you generate these fluctuations to start with from quantum noise and then you freeze them in. And it's these irregularities, these little peaks, which will later, tens of hundreds of thousands of years later, actually coalesce to make the galaxies. So it's an amazing thought that our Milky Way had its origin, which is now 100,000 light years across, had its origin in a quantum fluctuation at 10 to the minus 35 seconds. Well, I'm talking about extreme consequences of inflation. I've mentioned the fact that inflation tends to generate more matter energy. Uh, and there are, uh, let me now summarize what I just said about quantum noise and density fluctuations. So more stuff and more fluctuations. And that's what it takes to make the universe that we see today. today. So it's inflation plus quantum noise are the creative duo of our universe. First inflation. Now you can see already that there are important differences between second and first inflation. Second inflation occurs at much lower energy density. It's going on today. Second inflation only started recently. A few billion years ago, there's only been about one doubling in size so far, whereas the first inflation had more than a hundred doublings. First inflation was temporary. That scalar field from the Green Grand Unified Theory decayed into matter and inflation stopped and we got dumped out into a normal accelerating universe. But the future of second inflation is unknown because it's so recent. We haven't had time to measure it very long. We don't know whether that dark energy density is constant or not. We just don't know. So let's imagine for the moment that it is constant. There's room in Einstein's equation for a term like this and it came to be called the cosmological constant. Now the problem with this second inflation is that we have no physical explanation for it. Bizarre as inflation is, we actually have a theory for first inflation. It makes sense. We get it from known particle physics. But this second inflation is, is completely unexplained. Where and what this dark energy means. The main problem with it is the size of 
the dark energy, which is described by this constant called lambda. There is a natural size for lambda. It's something called the Planck density, which is 120 times bigger than the density that we're actually seeing in dark energy today. And so the real challenge of a theory of dark energy is to explain why it is so small and yet not zero. If it were zero, you might think, well, there's some law of nature that prevents us from having any dark energy. That's not the case. We have it. The problem is that it's way wrong size. And this is an example of something called the fine-tuning problem. But everywhere we look, we see examples of a fine-tuning problem. For example, Let's just start with the dark energy itself. We have attractive gravity, we have repulsive gravity, it's kind of like a love-hate relationship, yang-yin, you know, who's going to win? It turns out that if you quadrupled the amount of dark energy in the universe, repulsive gravity would be too strong and you'd never even make any galaxies, so we wouldn't be here. Okay, here's another fine-tuning. There's something called the strong force, which holds neutrons and protons together to make the nuclei of atoms. And if you perturb that force by just as little as 10%, either up or down, you'll either wind up with just protons and no nuclei at all, or you'll build super heavy nuclei and atoms would look completely different. You know, you'd have elements that are 3,000 instead of uh, 50 or something like that. And you wouldn't have chemistry. So again, we wouldn't be here. Here's an even finer fine-tuning. The nuclear interaction strength depends, it determines how stars are going to make elements in their cores. If you change the nuclear interaction strength by just plus or minus 4%, stars will either make everything into carbon and no oxygen, or they'll make everything into oxygen and no carbon and, again, we could not have life as we know it without both of those elements. Now, it turns out that there are a lot of these numbers. There's something called the standard model, which is a simplified model of particle physics, and there are about 25 numbers like this, along with the constants of the universe, the cosmology, lambda, and stuff like that. But there's another theory called string theory, which we'll talk about in a second, and People argue a little bit about how many parameters there are in string theory, but there are a lot more, maybe something like 125. And if you change these numbers by anywhere between 1 and 100% or so, the universe as we know it would simply cease to exist and we would not be here. As far as I know, only one of these numbers has as yet a plausible physical explanation, and that number is the spatial curvature of the universe, which is measured to be extremely flat. And that is actually predicted by inflation. So that first inflation that we had made a flat universe. So we actually have a physical explanation. But we're not doing too well. One out of 100 or 25 numbers is, you know, that's low batting average. So what are we going to do? Here is a new approach. And people are calling it the multiverse. Remember I referred to a cosmic machine which was out there generating solar systems? Let's take that concept and apply it instead to a cosmic machine that's generating universes. It's generating universes in huge numbers and they are all different. That's the key thing. They're, they're all different. If that were true, then we could stand back and say our universe is the way it is electron charge, strong force, etc. Because it's one of the few in this ensemble, the multiverse, whose parameters are in the range to support our kind of life. So, this has always seemed like a completely obvious argument to me, but it's remarkably controversial, so you might resist it and let me try to persuade you that actually it works. I'm going to persuade you by taking us back 2,000 years and having us all encourage us all to think like very intelligent Greek astronomers at that time who did wonderful astronomy with the tools available. So you've probably heard of the Aristotelian cosmology, which put Earth at the center and planets and stars 
moving around us in the celestial sphere. There was a number in that cosmology which probably looked to them to be very fundamental. It was the radius of the Earth. That de determined the curvature of the surface. Sound familiar? We worry today about the curvature of space in our universe. The Greeks, knowing what they know, would have worried about the curvature of our Earth. And furthermore, as far as they knew, Earth was unique. There was only one Earth. There was this one number. It must have looked to them like a fundamental constant of nature. So supposing they, as physicists, tried to predict what the ra radius of the Earth would be from first principles. Well, you know that that would have been a hopeless exercise. Instead, they should have thought in terms of a multiverse of Earths and other planets and decided those guys must be out there. I haven't seen them yet, but I believe that they are there because this logic is so compelling. And Earth is the way it is just because we need it to be like it is because we're on it. So that's the essence of the logic, and it's often caused, called anthropic, um, the anthropic principle. So now can we see any hope in modern physics to bolster the notion of the anthropic principle? The key thing that we need in order for this to make sense is the cosmic machine that is going to churn out universes. And that's why this, this theory supersymmetric string theory is so interesting. String theory says that there are really 10 or perhaps 11 dimensions of space-time and all but four of them are wrapped up in these tiny beings here called strings. And this is a, an elementary particle. It's vibrating and the way it vibrates determines what kind of particle it is. So space consists of a bunch of strings that are embedded in an extended space-time. This is an incredibly rich theory and it's very very complicated. Here is a lovely rendering of a string. This is an 11 dimensional entity and it's rotating, it's what we're seeing it is in projection into our three dimensions here. So I hope you don't ask me to explain this to you. Uh, I barely got through this and there was just enough to give this talk. <laughs> but there are some principles that are, that are pretty clear and I think everybody can understand them. The first principle is very important. The idea of supersymmetric string theory is very deep and profound. Physicists have been making a lot of progress recently by using um, generalization principles. They like to call them symmetry principles. And they'll see a quantity that's conserved and they'll like energy or angular momentum or something like that. And, and they'll deduce the existence of a mathematical structure based on that. And this has been wildly successful over the last hundred years or so. So there is a property that hasn't been used like this yet. And that is the fact that individual particles actually spin. It's like they were little tiny spinning tops. And people have been able to take that property and generate this larger um, apparatus of, of uh, mathematics based on that. And a consequence is to predict the existence of a whole new set of partner particles for the particles that we know and love here. For every particle that is now seen, there's going to be another supersymmetric partner particle. And some of these, we hope, are soon going to be produced at the Large Hadron Collider. So we're going to test this theory pretty soon. But for the cosmologist, this is what is important about supersymmetric string theory. It solves lots of key problems. The first thing is that the equations are complicated and they admit of many solutions. Some people admit, uh, estimate as many as 10 to the 500 different solutions. And each one of these solutions would generate a universe with different physical laws. They all have a time coordinate, but they can have different space, numbers of spatial dimensions. They would have different laws of forces. Some would have light, others wouldn't, etc. They'd be just wildly different. 
This theory also can produce, with some difficulty, a small cosmological constant. Remember, this is the number that's a factor of 10 to the 120 times smaller than we expected. You can do that with supersymmetric string theory. It's hard. So there wouldn't be very many universes that were like this, but it's non-zero. There would be some that would look like our, our universe. Also, we're generating partner particles here, and there's going to be a lightest one, which is going to be stable, and that is the natural candidate particle to be our dark matter particle. So we've solved that problem. And finally, these, these um, various solutions have dark energy, and it varies wildly in a landscape. And everywhere the dark energy is high, we have faster inflation, where it's low we have less inflation. And so it's possible to imagine a geometry which is overall expanding um, faster than the speed of light. It's an accelerating substrate because it's full of dark energy. And there are pieces of it that are expanding faster and slower. And so it's possible to have universes dump out and become uh, closed universes that are not expanding so fast. This process is called eternal inflation, where universes kind of erupt out of a substrate of dark energy that is infinite in extent and endlessly inflating. So let's confront head-on some of the more ridiculous things that I've said in this talk. We can actually talk meaningfully about processes at 10 to the minus 35 seconds and 10 to the 28th degrees Kelvin. An empty vacuum isn't empty at all. It can actually host an intense, very intense, and very active energy density full of fluctuates, interesting and active quantum fluctuations. It's possible for a universe to expand faster than light and matter energy spontaneously appears when this happens. And my favorite, a quantum fluctuation 10 to the minus 33 centimeters can later grow to become a galaxy 100,000 light years across. And this makes me think of a famous conundrum in physics uh, in quantum mechanics called Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat arises when we hook a macroscopic system, like a cat, to a quantum event, like a decaying radioactive atom that is quantum mechanical in nature and cannot be predicted. And a hallmark of quantum mechanics is that you don't know what's going on unless you're observing. So in the famous example, we put the cat, we hook, we put some poison gas in a box along with the cat and a hammer, and when the radioactive atom decays, the hammer hits the vial of poison gas, and the cat dies. This is all very dramatic. And the point is that when the lid is on the box, there are many who think that you don't know whether the cat is alive or dead. And furthermore, that the cat must be a superposition of two states and be alive and dead at the same time, and you won't actually determine the outcome until you lift the lid and look at the cat. I don't know why people don't think that cats can't observe themselves, but nevertheless, <laughs> you're, you're important in, in this example. So the conundrum has arisen here where we've connected a quantum event to a macroscopic event, and that's exactly what makes galaxies in our universe. And so we thought maybe we could live our lives without worrying about what quantum mechanics really means, but now we see that we really don't know how our galaxy formed unless we figure out quantum mechanics. So here are some parting thoughts. For anthropic reasoning to make sense, we have to assume that this multiverse really exists, even though we have not yet seen it. Is this kind of reasoning scientific? I firmly believe that it is. In fact, I think it has been the most fruitful concept in cosmology. It explains why the Earth looks the way it does, why the solar system has the arrangement that it does. It explains why the Milky Way is the way it is. So explaining the universe as a whole is simply the next step as far as I'm concerned. 
The multiverse and our universe are both closely related to something called the steady state theory, which had this uncontrolled wild exponential expansion. And in order to produce that, the people who invented the steady state theory had to create matter. They had to do so at the following rate. Here's the Empire State Building. They had to create spontaneously, with no reason given, a hydrogen atom every hundred years in the volume of the Empire State Building. That turns out to be exactly the rate at which we're creating new dark energy today. So that's the rate that it takes in order to maintain the density of the universe if it's all hydrogen gas. Well, these people were laughed out of the ballpark. Um, even though some of their names were very famous, we went on to discover a Big Bang, the universe appears to be evolving and so on. I think these people now have the last laugh. Okay. Because, in fact, it's inflationary states that actually do all the work in cosmology and probably in, our, in other universes in addition to ours. And so on the same topic, Einstein regretted sticking lambda into his formulas, but in fact, lambda turns out to be the most originally new component of general relativity. It's, it's what does all the work for us. Inflation is a generic process and is in fact is responsible for everything in the universe and the multiverse. It is why we are here. It is the closest thing that physics has to God. So, what I've been emphasizing is the unity of nature, broadly conceived. So I'll leave you with this beautiful little verse from William Blake, his poem called Auguries of Innocence. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. That is really what modern cosmology does. We think we're looking out in space and back in time, but we're not. We are making use of the photons that are right here, right in the palm of our hand at the moment. The photons that are arriving on our telescopes. This is a snapshot of a single place, a grain of sand, and a second of time. And from this, we've been able to deduce the past and the future and the existence of other universes beyond our own. It truly is a wonderful theory. Thank <laughs> you.